You're listening to Healing Voices Project, where we share stories and the latest information from people who fight addiction every day. I'm Mike Torvelt, your host and author of Voices from the Fallen. Thank you for listening, for following, and most of all, for sharing with people you care about. Make your voice count too. everybody, thanks for coming back to Healing Voices Project. I'm Mike Torville, your host, and every week, or every couple of weeks, uh, we come back with a guest. Usually it's in our studio, but today we're doing something different. We're on the campus of the Swift River Addiction Campus in Cummington, Massachusetts. And uh, we're here meeting with Nicole Amendola, who's a treatment advocate, yes. uh, who's coming up on your, your one year anniversary. Yes. That's great. Congratulations. Thank you. That's Thank great. you. Also, in addition to your one year anniversary, two and a half years sober. Correct. Um, so you've got a few things to talk about, what your role is here at Swift River, a little bit about your experiences. We're glad to have you. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Sure. And thanks for having us here. Oh, so, yeah. We're yeah. happy to have yeah. you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, now, first of all, I'll just tell you, this is a beautiful campus. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about it. Sure. Yeah. So at Swift River, we are located on the base of the Berkshire Mountains. Uh, we are on a vast 250 acre campus. We work exclusively with clients who are looking to expand their treatment modalities. Um, we look for people who are excited to be here, excited to get back into nature, and maybe if they aren't at that point yet, somebody, we can influence them to find something new in their early recovery that will hopefully give them some fundamental things to take home with them once they discharge with us. We work a lot on the campus with various ropes courses. We do a lot of art therapy. We have some yoga classes. A lot of free time is also given to the clients where they have autonomy in the programming throughout the day so they don't feel like they're you know caged in. Um, we find that it works really well with them to let them have a voice here and we have certain groups that are formulated to allow that to happen. There's a lot here going on. Yeah. There is. And uh, <laughs> just looking around you can see the activities and the sure. beautiful campus. Uh, what is your job? So my job, I'm a treatment advocate, treatment outreach coordinator, clinical liaison. What that is, is I am the point of contact between the whether it be client's family member, the hospital that they may be admitted in, the IOP program that they may be enrolled in that they have since relapsed. I'm the point of contact between the facility and the client and their origin, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, so I act as just about everything, right? I act as a source of support for family, a source of support for the client, as well as a source of support for our clinical staff here. Once the client is admitted, I can act as somebody who will relay messages back and forth, of course, if allowed through the client. Um, we are allowed to give out various information, update their IOP program as to when they will be discharging and going back into their care. Um, and also, I like to come on campus to see the people that I've helped get into treatment mm -hmm. and to let them know that I'm not ju just a voice over the phone and let them know that people really do care. You've been only been here a year. Sounds like you've been yeah. here for years. <laughs> You're half your life with all of that. You've come a long way. Well, half of and, my new life. Yeah. Half of my recovery life, yeah. right? We're going to um. talk about that too, yeah. <laughs> so. so in a year, you've come a long way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's fantastic. Every day. Um, <laughs> Something new. <laughs> and yeah, as a treatment advocate, you really just bundle a lot into that role, yeah. don't you? Um, so let's go back then to, to talk about what brought you here. Sure. And... You know, at, at your own experiences. So let's go back. As I said earlier, we're going to put you into a deep hypnotic sleep. Okay, here we go. Watch <laughs> the pen tick. <laughs> so you're going to go. I've done this before. I think. Yeah, yeah. So we won't go that deep. Um, but we, we want to bring back because we, it's always interesting to see, you know, your progress sure. and what led you here. Is not only is how it enhances your role, the ability for you to relate to people, but also too. 
how people can learn from your own experiences. And sometimes people will give up hope and say, no, I can't make it through. You did. Yeah. And you're and you're here now with such enthusiasm and, yeah. and excitement <laughs> and, and, and passion for what you do. I can see sure. that. Uh, yeah. So let's go back to where things started to go awry for you. Absolutely. So actually, six days from now, I'll be turning 31. Wow. So I got sober when I was 28. Um, I never really, I wasn't your picturesque addict alcoholic, right? I wasn't sitting on a park bench, what society thinks a down and out alcoholic looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, I was high functioning at the time. I had a job. I owned a home. I had a car. I had all of these monetary material things. And not to interrupt you, but no. prior to having the car, the job, and functioning in your working life, sure. did this all start when you were a young adult working or did it start when you were t younger than that? Um, so yeah. I went through a lot as a child. I had um, separation of home. Mm -hmm. I had uh, parents. Parents got divorced. Yeah, yeah, so they've always been divorced. So I've always had that separation. Mm -hmm. but. When I was 12 years old, my father was diagnosed with brain cancer. And at that time, my mother also had her second child. And then my father had his second child through different relationships. So that caused me to just be solo, right? I had to grow up really young. I had to be super hyper independent. Um, I just remember like having every thought was, am I going to be okay? Right? Will I be okay? It's a lot for 12 or 13 years. Yeah. yeah. Or... Who do I even go to now? Because everybody has their separate families and it's just Nicole and their by own, herself. their own priorities. Right. That, that didn't include That you. aren't me anymore. Yeah. They have babies. I'm 15 years old and I'm like, what happened to me, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that that started a lot of everything up here. Um, I was a really, I'll, I have no problem saying this, I was a really good ice hockey player. Um, I played ice hockey my whole life um, and then when I was getting ready to go to college, I got partial scholarship and my father's cancer came back and I decided to stay home. Um, upon staying home, I really think I jump-started my addictions. Uh, alcohol? Um, alcohol and cocaine. I was a heavy both, but never one without the other. Mm -hmm. um, and it led me to terrible relationships which then led me to a terrible mental state and bouncing around more homes, right? I went from a child to go from this house to this house, and then now in my own adult life, I was doing the same thing again. So behaviors were repeating itself, and I, I didn't recognize that until I got sober. Um, I then, you know, I went to dental assisting school. I had a great career as a dental assistant for about 12 years. But even th you kept up your mm -hmm. drinking and Oh, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Every day. Um, it wasn't, I wasn't drinking at work. I was waiting to clock out and just all gas, no breaks. Yeah. Um, I started out as maybe like happy hour and then Friday, Saturday, and then it turned into the only day I wasn't drinking was Monday because I was so distraught mentally from the anxiety of everything and then physically ill um, from everything that I had just put my body through. And I was a binge blackout drinker. Um, so then I would have to wake up and what I like to call the apology tour, look through my phone and see what was going on. you couldn't recall what, nothing. what transpired. Nothing. Wow. And as we spoke about like walking in here, I went to so many different events, right? And I don't remember. That's scary. Collectively, like any of them. That's scary. Right? Yeah. But then you'd get up and go to work the next day. Yep. And yeah. like, it's all good. And I thought that nobody knew. And I worked for the same practice for were almost you, 10 you, years. Were you correct? Nobody knew? Until Somebody my knew. world imploded. Uh, what happened? Um, about four days before I went to treatment, I was on a really bad, I'd probably say six month run. And then I was on a really, really bad like three week run where there was nothing else going into my body other than drugs and alcohol and whatever I could keep down. Mm -hmm. And four days before I went to treatment, I actually fell down my own stairs in my home and Tore knocked by yourself. Yeah. And I knocked my front tooth out and I didn't remember. And I woke up in the morning and it was gone. I had half a tooth and I worked for an oral surgery practice. So you showed up for work. I showed up for work. 
and I was still. And they said, gee, what happened to your tooth? I must have reeked like alcohol. No. I t- <laughs> and then didn't have an answer. Because like, I didn't know. You're right. <laughs> I had no idea. I was Did like, well, can story? you tell yeah. me? Yeah, wow. Um, And then I had a couple events that weekend, one being a gender reveal for my nephew. Mm -hmm. And it was a family event with about 100 people there. And um, started at 11, and I don't even remember arriving in the morning, 11 in the morning, because I was so intoxicated, because I kept going from the night before. You get through the event, though, somehow. Barely. Yeah. Because the next morning I woke up and went to treatment. Um, How did you decide, or did you decide, or did somebody encourage you to go? It was an encouraged decision. It wasn't an ultimatum decision because I got fired that afternoon. And it was, we've given you so many chances and blah, blah. And I didn't even know that I was being given chances because I was so stuck in the hamster wheel and the monotony of my addictions that I couldn't recognize anything going on around me. Mm-hmm. And I lost my job, and then my cousin who was pregnant, um, we had a conversation, and she just looked at me and said, I think that you should just get a full reset in. And I had known. I had known that I had a problem. I just could never muster up the confidence to announce it and go seek treatment and get myself help. Where did you go? Well, let me be, besides where did you mm-hmm. go, how did you know where to go? So my stepfather worked in the treatment industry. Oh. And I reached out to him and I said, I'm struggling really badly and I need to go to treatment tonight. Um, I got sober at a facility in Connecticut mm-hmm. and I've been sober since April 10th of 2022. Congratulations. Thank That's great. you. Yeah. And through getting sober, I have realized that the life that I was leading before was not my authentic self. And everybody talks about when you get sober, you get yourself back. I started drinking at 14 years old, so I actively have to discover who I actually am. I don't know who Nicole is. I didn't know who Nicole was for the past 15 years. I spent 15 years running from whatever I thought I shouldn't be instead of running towards what I thought I should be. Um, and now I recognize that through substances, alcohol, drugs, that I was only getting in my own way when in that time I thought everybody else was in my way and why me and why me when I didn't recognize that I was doing it all to myself the whole time. When you went in for treatment, did it work that first time or did you have... That's it. That's it for you. I'm going for one and done. Yeah. For myself. Well. And that comes day to day. I don't, when I was in treatment, I used to get so furious with them because they used to say, stay present, you know, be present. And I'm like, I'm here. I'm here. What more do you want want from me? Right? Right? Like I'm present. Nicole, present. Yes, hi. But now I realize it's about not looking so far, right? About what I don't have or what I want, right? It's about right here today. I wake up meditate in the morning now, I'm sober, that's a great start, right? Um, And then, okay, what am I doing in the next hour? What am I doing in today? And I'm not... You you learned what being present meant. Yeah, and I'm not harping on what was either. That's one of the trickiest things is to allow myself to forgive myself for all the things that I did and the way that I acted and the relationships that I... It's not easy, is it? No. Especially looking back, and you still had a lot of mysteries about events and people sure. and who you hurt and even uh, yeah. injuries from your tooth, but sure. a lot of blank spaces there. Yeah. Um, and when you went through, is there was there a person or something that really stuck with you or something that was a pivotal point? Sure. Yeah. I still am involved in my program's alumni events and everything like that. And I think that is a direct result of the staff that was on site. The staff that was on site were some of the most caring, compassionate, and relatable people that I had encountered in a long time. Mm -hmm. I felt that I was in a facility that people understood. 
what and I was going through. From what you said earlier in your teen interview, you were lacking that. So this filled a, 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 a hole that you said, wow, there's actually, I'm important to people. Exactly. Yeah. And there are two specific um, clinicians there that I don't know that I would have been successful without them. There are people that showed me support from when I walked in the door to when I still see them two and a half years later. Mm -hmm. And I see them at, one is a big deadhead and I work at a music venue and I see him at yeah. concerts. And like, yeah. I'll never forget the first time. And I'm like, I'm still sober. And he's like, I know you are. And I'm like, how? He's like, you wouldn't have said hi to me if you weren't. And I'm like, you're right. I wouldn't have, I would have ran the other that's, way. I'm yeah, like, you got me. That's true. Yeah. So yes, yeah. I do believe yeah. that it's not about the actual place that I went to treatment. I do think their modalities were wonderful and they gave me good tools, but it's about the individuals that I encountered there, staff and fellow patients alike. That obviously meant a lot to you. And even somehow when you were sober, when you became sober in April of 2022, mm -hmm. two and a half years going on very closely now. Yeah. Um, you've been here for a year. Mm -hmm. This is your first job yeah. in this field. Um, what transpired from that point in April 2022 to now that led you here? Sure. So when I first got sober, I, in town, the town that I live in, there's a wonderful nonprofit um, and it couples exercise and meetings together. And I've always been an athlete. I love to exercise. So I was like, oh, this will probably be good for me. But there was no hockey playing for you. This, no, unfortunately, no, I'm a little washed up now, you know, <laughs> like my, my prime time is over. Yeah. Um, but I, that was my at home sober community. Through that community, I then built relationships. And through those relationships, I found professional relationships, right? I was in a terrible job for my mental health and this was last summer and I said, I can't do this anymore. I respectfully quit and I just had no job. And I was approached by somebody who works at Swift River, um, who I met through that nonprofit who is now a friend of mine. And they said, I know you're in recovery. I think you'd be really good at this. Do you want to work for us? And I was like, are you sure? Do you want me to work for you? I've never done this before, right? Mm -hmm. And through the past year, now I might need those tissues. <laughs> through the past year, I've been able to feel like I have a true purpose. And I'm really able to help the people that I was like. Um, when I didn't have anybody, there's people that lended their arm to me and extended the olive branch to make it possible for me to wake up the next day and know that it's a new day mm -hmm. and it's just one more day. So when I work, I can have the most frustrating day where nobody even wants to know my name, right, in the field. But then I can come on campus the following day and I can meet somebody that I helped over the phone and they look me in the face and they say, you saved my life or thank you for getting me here. And I'm good for another five years, <laughs> you know, like it's things like that, yeah, yeah. that yeah. I now am that source of support that I needed for so long that I didn't know how to ask for. Mm -hmm. And I want to be the source of support for people without them having to ask. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I want them to know that when they're in this hopeless down and out state that there are people that genuinely care even if they don't know them on a, if I don't know them on a personal level it's because there's the relatability aspect in this field that I think is so important to have people in the community of the facility that are in recovery because I feel like I could smell it on people right of course you can you <laughs> so can. yes when I'm yeah in a, a treatment facility and I'm probably not too excited to be there. Somebody that I can feel that I can talk to and they understand me was the most helpful thing to me. Well, as you said earlier, the people that in your first treatment, that how much they meant and how much they cared, you now are exemplifying that to, to others. And yeah. you become 
part of what you saw in those other people. And I think that person who said, hey, why don't you, uh, they recognize something in you, mm -hmm. obviously, that I could see after meeting you for 10 <laughs> minutes, um, <laughs> that uh, you've got that passion in you. And I think that was a great decision on, on both your parts yeah. for them. It to, was scary. You know, oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> What's a new feeling? You know, what am I doing? But I think you've f found your calling here. Absolutely. And yeah. the thing about scary things, which I found out the scariest day in my life, was pulling into treatment right mm -hmm. but it turned out to be the best decision i ever made yeah that's incredible because of course number one i'm able to help myself now mm -hmm. but the first thing i was asked when i arrived at detox was what is your main goal for getting sober and it was to be reliable and it was to be accountable and now i feel like Everybody calls me. <laughs> and Be careful what you some days I'm like, oh, a little too <laughs> again, you know, and this is yeah. personally, this is not professionally, but it's like yeah. now I can confidently say that I will be there. I will pick up the phone. And especially for my family and especially for my brothers. I don't have to miss um sporting events or graduations or things like that because I'm too hungover or I'm already drunk and I can't get there. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for me to remain reliable and um, be there for people and myself. Because if I'm not there for myself, there's no possible way I can help anybody else. That's true, yeah. And you know, that's why doing what I do keeps me in my recovery mode 24 7 mm -hmm. so it helps me on my sobriety as well helping other people right. work on theirs and people like yourself that that really that helps so much having that relatability yeah and um the reliability as you said now that sure. didn't exist before no no yeah. no wow you couldn't you yeah. would catch me at every event it just maybe for 10 minutes you yeah, know, like yeah. she'll be here, but and then we also don't know what she's. And you be have like. no recollection of it oh. afterwards, anyway. Exactly. Um, <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Of course. Um, and I think this is this is something that uh, you can't. I can't see you doing anything else. I can't either, and I'm really <laughs> happy about that. Yeah. I really am, and yeah. yeah. The team that we have here, I. I don't think I would ever find it anywhere else. And, and the, the, the team that you have, we met some of the people mm -hmm. here, and besides it being a beautiful campus, you had a great team of people here. And let's go real quick through yeah, of some course. of the services that you offer. I'm mean, gonna have a, a list here, but some of the, I mean, it's Absolutely. detox, residential sure. treatment. So we so, offer yeah. detox and residential treatment. Mm -hmm. um, we also offer MAT, which is medica medication, medically assisted treatment, mm -hmm. right? So if somebody comes in on, let's say methadone, mm -hmm. Uh, we can maintain them on their dose. Mm -hmm. And that is really important um, because some people struggle with multiple substances. So we like to rid them of what is troubling them versus what is kind of keeping them at their baseline. Mm -hmm. So say somebody comes in and they're on methadone, they're an ex you know, opiate addict, but now they're struggling with alcohol, we can get them off of the alcohol while still maintaining them at their proper baseline that they started sobriety at. Um, we also offer art therapy, one-on-one -on -one group, one-on-one ther -on -one therapy, group therapy settings. We offer some virtual um, AA meetings as well as on site. So we get some alumni come in. Um, we have alumni events. We have an alumni app that we like everybody to download because staying connected afterwards is super important. Um, we also offer yoga. We do some fly fishing and mountain biking and ropes course in the summer. Mm -hmm. And then in the winter, we do some snowshoeing. Um, and one thing that is really a really great program that we do offer is a first responders and veterans program mm -hmm. um, where we are able to house separately if necessary. The veterans come in with the 10 week curriculum that really touch on love and intimacy and reintegration back into the community. Mm -hmm. um, and we like to cover everything from top to bottom on there, mm -hmm. um, especially with well, veterans and first responders. It's, it's an impressive program. It's an impressive uh, campus. 
and how can people find out about the um, Swift River? SwiftRiver.com, is that? So we have a Facebook page. Yeah. Um, we also have our website, Swift River. Mm -hmm. We also offer tours to anybody who may be interested. Um, I myself, in my job, I go out to hospitals. I go out to other programs. I go out to, like I talked about, intensive outpatient centers. And I give sort of a presentation on what we have to offer so that way they can be educated on the services and know that there are resources that are reliable. And I'll speak for myself, I work off my personal cell phone as well. So when I say call me anytime, I actually mean it because it's my personal cell and it's there. So I'm always willing to educate and talk to people. How do people find out what your cell phone number is? I have it <laughs> all over my business cards. Okay. Hopefully. When I go in town, like all the coffee and, shops, they're hanging out. And everywhere. if somebody wanted to contact you, they probably should call Swift River first yes. and then they'll direct. To you can phone. actually, that's a misconception. Oh. So I love to have somebody call me directly mm -hmm. because that way I can take the burden off of them trying to coordinate where to start. Okay. I'm a great starting point. Anybody on our team is a great starting point, but we do have a admissions line that anybody can call 24 seven and weekends, nights, anything like that. But that's my thing is to make it easier for everybody involved. How easy do you want to make it? Do you want to share your number? Sure. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. 203-415-7826. <laughs> right. And our two admission, zero three yeah. four one five seven eight two six seven eight two six. And then our admissions line is eight four four two eight five nine five three one. And that will get you somebody at any time of day. And, and even as a bait, look up Swift River Education yep. Campus, and you'll find SwiftRiver.com. Yeah. Well, you've said a lot. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. I have no trouble. Thanks for sharing no that. Yeah. <laughs> We'll, we'll uh, do it again another time. We I sure hope so. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. All right. Well, thanks again. And um, thanks, everybody, for listening. And again, visit swiftriver.com. Thanks, everybody. See you soon.